Karen is from Northwestern Massachusetts, and she's been writing as far back as she can remember. And lately, she's been getting a lot of attention for this writing of poetry, including the 2014 Penn New England Award in Poetry and the first book award from Zone 3 Press and a finalist for the Massachusetts Book Award. And she's the winner of the 2014 Split This Rock Poetry Prize and the 2012 Boxcar Poetry Review. She also serves as poetry editor for Amherst Live, a twice yearly production of poetry and politics and more, and is a Mass Cultural Council Fellow. Karen also teaches writing to engineers at UMass in Amherst. And by the looks of the advice on her blog, she is a very good teacher indeed. And I thought I'd just offer a few lines of advice that she gives her writers. Support writing, go to readings, buy books, read journals, send a little note to a poet whose poem was so amazing it blew the top of your head off. Never send a note to tell a writer you don't like his or her work. That's not your job. You won't like everything, and hallelujah for a variety of styles and approaches in the world of writing. Imagine how many people would have emailed Emily Dickinson. Be prepared for a lot of rejection. It will feel terrible. Take it with grace. Work on your craft and keep submitting. Don't hate the editors. Remember, there are a ton of great writers out there, which is wonderful, but it makes publishing very difficult. If you begin getting encouraging rejections, then you're on to something. Keep at it. And finally, publishing does not have to be your goal. Write because you love it, because nothing else makes your frontal lobe glimmer in the same way. And with that, I would like to introduce to you Karen Schofield to share her poetry with us. Please give her a warm welcome up here. This is called Where Babies Come From. In case you didn't know, this is the time to find out. <laughs> I thought they were handing me a baby, but it's a star in my arms, a small one just born. Whoever said they twinkle has never held one. It's blue and not very warm, and though I don't know a thing about stars, I start to worry. I give a tickle, blow on it, sing a little song, all my tricks. The star perks up, then settles into me like it belongs. Everyone else at the party is clustered by the hors d'oeuvres. Hey, I say, hey, I should probably give this nice star back. Blank looks. I mean, it's not my star. It doesn't even look like me. But it sort of does right around the edges. So I try again. OK, it does sort of look like me in the way that everything in the universe resembles everything else in that interconnected way. You know, a breeze starts in the Horsehead Nebula, and we feel it in Bear's Paw Galaxy. Or a butterfly is trampled by a horse, and I can't remember what's supposed to happen with the butterfly, but I know it was profound. They've turned back to the food, what's left of the warm brie. These are not the people you want between you and the lifeboats. A woman approaches, cute baby, she says. She keeps her hands behind her back. It's instinct, you know. If something's held out, you can't help but take it in your arms. This next one's called homunculus. And I used to explain to my audiences what a homunculus was, but then I realized they're all so much smarter than I am. I don't have to describe those words. <coughs> Who doesn't love the idea of a body wrapped up in another body? If someone hadn't already thought of it, I'd invent the homunculus. I'd put little people everywhere, not just in sperm, but wood glue, the popcorn pieces on the couch, the gills of fish, orzo, pearlescent teeth, navy beans, and of course, teardrops. Every teardrop would have a little person, and when the tears splashed down, the person would be free. What I can't decide is if the person would be a baby or an adult. Baby problem. No homunculus-sized diapers. Adult problem, your conscience made real, or what if you fell in love with that little mite? How would you, you know, split the household chores? Maybe I'm lingering on details when the big picture is still pretty cool, because these homunculi would honor me as their creator. 
I'd thought to put them in the dewdrops, the coagulated beef grease. They'd hold little parades, march with their tiny signs bearing aquarelles of me, shout their thanks, which would sound like the lazed buzzing of bees. Because there's so many of them, they'd do all the things I couldn't. They'd be kinder and better. They'd plant, they'd pet all the good dogs, plant more flowers. There's a swinging contradance band called Einstein's Little Homunculus. And when Brendan asked me what that meant, I told him. How do you know that word, he said. I said, I thought everyone knew it. <laughs> this is called Lost Mountain. I hate when I misplace entire geographical features. There was the oxbow. That's understandable. It's meandering ways. How easy to set it on the countertop or above the fridge and walk away, then think of it weeks later, all dried out. Blame my husband if I can, since he is forever depositing items on the mantle. Next, the savanna, or really just a portion of the savanna. I don't want my muddle-headedness out of proportion. Yes, it was large enough for two lion prides and their prey, but it wasn't the whole thing. Slip behind the couch, as savannas sometimes do, and it wasn't until the vultures started circling that I knew. And what a shock then to find the savanna, which honestly, no one had missed, instead of the ice cap, which we talked about every day. The salt flat was not my fault. And the hills, who can see them through the haze? Then the volcano, which you wouldn't think I could lose, what with the accompanying poisonous gas, molten lava, etc. But I have a knack for this. I am forever losing sunglasses, too. How my husband hates that, since I like the expensive polarized type. The delta, the river system, the continental divide the little desert, and then the bigger one. The worried looks on the children's faces as if I had misplaced the whole world and lost something that was really theirs. I know, away from the mic. Because you don't need the glug, glug, glug. This is called, Rumors of Her Death Have Been Greatly Exaggerated. And this is probably the time to mention, because you're going to hear more of it in, well, another poem, is that um, I served in the military for seven years. And um, I've been uh, spending a lot more time, especially recently, writing about um, the moral ambiguity of the military. Mistake one driving by two cemeteries when the kids are tired. Mistake two, saying only some people get buried. Where are the others, my son asks. So I have to explain cremation. I'm smart enough to leave out burials at sea, bodies never found, the yawn of earthquakes, missing children, teens on spring breaks that never end, Bodies hidden, basements, and old barns, and attics. What war can do? Shells, mortar around, the terror of claymore mines. They're filled with old screws and nuts, metal scraps twisting through bodies until they embed deeply into trees, even rocks. Someone angry invented these, someone who lived in a junkyard. So I don't say this. All the while, I'm trying to change the subject, get them home. Look at the Christmas lights, the yellow car, the cement mixer. But where do you want your ashes, he says. Where is it that you love? He's crying. He's tapping my shoulder. I'm exclaiming over a stray dog. And do you think we'll get more snow? Wouldn't you love more snow, Walker? He's saying, when is daddy going to die? Don't die before me. I have both hands on the wheel. 
I'm remarking over the stars. Help me look for the moon. I'm slowing for a stoplight that is red, 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 red. I'll do it this way. A couple of poems not in the book. These are military. Uh, this one's called Double Arm Transplant because modern medicine is amazing. Even grafted limbs sigh when the rains come. The hands, those twin divining rods, may tremble in the presence of an old love. Now they're the arms of a veteran the hair that grows from the arms a different shade. Since the transplant, he writes left-handed. He waits for the hands to reveal their previous life as farmer or electrician. By a piano, he pauses to see if the wrists rise to the music, if the knuckles love the baseball, if the fist curls in anger. Before. Did he drum his fingers on the desk? Was the salute quite so crisp? On its own, the pinky angles to the teacup. It's the giver of these arms speaking whenever he debones a fish or juggles. Every time a tennis ball comes down, it sits in the palm for a moment, then rises again. While I was going through, the, um, the book that was given to all new recruits in the Army was called the Smart Book, which stood for the Soldier's Manual of Army Training. As you can imagine, we got a big laugh out of the idea of it being the Smart Book, but it had all the tasks that, that soldiers were all expected to know and to be able to perform. Now they call it something different. It's something like a warrior's handbook or something like that. But in my time, that's what it was called. And so I've written a bunch of poems from it. Uh, some are real and imagined uh, tasks. Um, this one starts out being real and sort of strays from there. Um, this is called the Army Smart Book, M18A1 Claymore Mine. Um, and this is a quote from the Smart Book. The number of ways in which the Claymore Mine may be employed is limited only by the imagination of the user. And I thought, they have not met me yet. <laughs> the perfect doorstop, heavy, unobtrusive, can be used to conk intruders on the head. It won't go off accidentally, no worries, it's not that kind of mine. While waiting for the next war, it's a handy paperweight. Sunk in the fish tank, over time it grows a patina of algae and the grommies give it kisses. Look at the catfish whiskering the detonator well. What they don't know won't hurt them. Claymore mines are excellent for propping the wobbly table, bookending, pounding nails. Okay, pounding nails might be pushing it, but it really is okay to scrape the windshield's ice. <laughs> Toddler can't reach the table, planting roses, yes and yes. Your five-year-old can practice sounding out the words front toward enemy. Your teenager, forever noodling with things, can admire the priming adapter, the simple bowed front, the interior full of iron fragments, as innocuous as a toolbox. In fact, a toolbox is a nice place to store claymores, or perhaps the living room. This is a weapon that fits into daily life. With the metal legs unfolded, it looks like some old TV with rabbit ears. There you sit staring at the thing, wishing someone else would change the channel. My last army poem, and then I'll switch to a couple of more, a couple of not army poems. And this is another army smart book one, but this is um, an invented task. This is called On Being Lost. Step number one, berate yourself for not taking a buddy to go pee. Step number two, don't panic. You may choose to A, yell and wake up one of the other girls, or 
B. Stay quiet, embarrassed to speak. With option B, move deeper into the woods. Number three, it's your first time away from home. Number four, when your toes hit the ocean, you'll know you're screwed. Number five, you're in camouflage but want to be found. Isn't that funny? Come on, it's funny. Step number six, leaves at night feel like little hands. Number seven, that's a lot of little hands. Number eight, the enclave of tents should be at irregular spacings through the trees. Don't make it easy on the enemy. Number nine, or each other. Number 10, technically you are all still children, but soldiers. Number 11, you can't drink or stay out past 2300, but you can shoot people. Number 12, did your parents sign the standard in loco parentis form? Number 13, loco also means crazy. Number 14, thank you Spanish class. Number 15, where it says you can shoot people, that means people of the Army's choosing. Number 16, with no visual cues, subjects will wander in circles as small as 20 meters. Number 17, false dawn caused by sunlight scattering off dust. Number 18, how it will make your heart sing. It will feel like first love imagining the night gone. Number 19, dust rearranged, light shimmers off, it's you in the dark again. Number 20, you're made to look like trees to disappear. This next one's called chiromancy, which is the same thing as palmistry. And you've got to love a language that has to have more than one word for palmistry because it just wasn't enough to have one. There's a new line on my left palm from thumb almost to wrist, knife slip. Part of it bled, but the rest is dry riverbed, as if I'd run out of blood, as if the drought and famines had come, as if the ocean receded and kept receding, rows of beach houses left inland and dry. I was cutting an avocado at a campsite in California, which wouldn't be exciting, except the avocados there cost 25 cents, which is enormously exciting to those on my coast. So this line has joined the other lines on my palm, the my heart line longer than life, the warble of fate, future in a skin fold, past tucked in the simian crease, the stubborn head, the planets in my hand. Below this, veins that appear more blue each year, the skin thinning, the lungs filling a little less, and now there's another line to consider, Perhaps it is my Swiss Army line, or who taught you to hold a knife line, or you think that's bad, you've got an artery about an inch away line, and the new line pointing to the artery, the wrist's soft pulse so loved by the suicidal in their warm baths, they must be more committed than I, with more on their minds than inexpensive avocados and a little boy looking on, mommy, did you cut yourself? And I dropped the knife and the fruit, luckily not on my foot, because I wasn't certain which had wounded me. So fast and sure it might have been the avocado lashing out. And I stared at them both, pinching shut this new open part of me, this new access point with blood scarleting in the air. What joy to be blood escaped and sun filled at last, satiated, set free, and to distract my son, I thrust both hands under the picnic table and said, Did you know that knife is one of those funny words that starts with a silent K, like night? And he said, You mean night like a warrior night or like the night when it's dark? 
for a long moment, I held one bloodied hand in one uncut hand, and for the life of me, couldn't remember. And this is the last poem. It's also the last poem in the book. See how that worked out? <laughs> I skipped a bunch, though. And this is called Frost in the Low Areas, and so it seems really good to read on a day like today. Water break. <coughs> oh, that is excellent water. Frost in the Low Areas. The health survey said he would live to 76, and I 86. Something to do with men's hearts on their worn old grapevines. Something to do with their will to lay down and die. In the westerns, how glad they were to give their lives away. Bad guy, if you can't shoot down a June bug's nostril, you don't stand much of a chance. Men, thinking they don't have to cut power to a bound up saw blade. Just think, Dennis says. Ten years to yourself. No one stealing the sheets or the last of the ham. He says this as we make pesto. This is how we joke with each other. Ha ha. And then we kiss. Seriously, he says, imagine no more socks on the mantle. My arms, the sharp odor of garlic, basil, Parmesan cheese. Tonight, a frost the herbs won't survive. Twilight, we work the rose, frantic, our gentleness gone. Behind us, nothing but stems and their faint heat. Before us, the first crisp morning. Thank you. From a trench they charged at dawn and the enemy just mowed them down. Love lost, buried under Vegan. Where the willows weep and the thrushes dream, poppies ponder peaceful scenes. Silence lays souls to rest, tucks them in to forget. Life has found an old home. Life has found an old home. of grass for get a war but old ghosts linger under the gun down below the war remains where unexploded bombs decay these poison Yes. 
not woken When life returns here hopeful Yes, life is coming home To Verdun To play with words in the meandering middle of the night reverie is to know the splendor of fertile ground. While the censor sleeps and the inspector is off duty, words drift and flow in an uninhibited swirl, unencumbered, unfettered, agile as they search for their place somewhere. Hope abounds. For all words are worthy approximations in nighttime's mind's eye view. Close enough, they will stand up to the scrutiny of the daylight zone, <clears throat> when perhaps a couple might be just right. Peach and pear.